Have you ever gotten a gift and uh, you thought, hey, uh, you, you know, it just wasn't what you were expecting, or, or maybe you thought, I'm really going to use this, and then you didn't, you know, or, or, uh, or you, you got a gift that you thought, I'm, this is no big deal, this is not something that's going to be very useful, but then you really loved it. You know, it was just better than you expected. Uh, a couple Christmases ago, someone in my family got me this uh, this this metal, this plastic harness that held, uh, holds an iPad or a cell phone, you know, you put it around your neck and then it holds it here. And really they, they, they got this gift for me because they're making fun of me, which I'm, I'm for, you know, I, I'm, I'm with this. I'm okay with that. But, you know, occasionally I'll sit back on, a, on the couch or a recliner or whatever, kind of lean back and I'll hold, do some work on an iPad on this natural table that I've created and it'll just kind of rest there. And so they, they bought me this harness that keeps it around your neck. You can walk around the house with the iPad there. And, and uh, here's, the, here's the deal. I, you know, I looked for like three minutes this week for this gift from a couple years ago. I couldn't find it. I'm not sure where it is. I, I don't use that gift very much, right? I've spent years developing this particular table, and I'll utilize that just fine. And, and so sometimes you get gifts that you just don't use that much. Sometimes you get gifts that you, you just not what you expect. This last Christmas, I, I uh, was going to buy this Lego set from the old television show Friends. Some of you remember that television show. They have a Lego set of the coffee shop on that show. And, and I thought, I'm going to buy this. And, and I saw online what I thought was this Lego set. And I thought, man, this is a really good deal. And so I ordered it. And Amazon shipped it right away and it arrived and I opened it up and it was this little bitty box and I thought this box is too small for a Lego set and what I actually ordered the reason this was such a spectacular deal is because I just ordered these little Christmas lights that you can insert into the actual Lego set <laughs> to light up the Lego set but it just not what I was expecting and uh, the reason for that great deal. Sometimes, though, we, we get a gift we're, we're just not expecting. Occasionally, though, we get a gift that's more than we expected. You know, it's, it's better than we thought it could be. Uh, a Christmas or so ago, I, I unwrapped a present that Sherry got for me, and it was a shoe box, and I thought, that's cool. Shoes, I wear shoes. <laughs> and, I, you know, I'm, I just... I, it's not that big a deal to me, but I, I do wear shoes in public mostly. And so I unwrapped them. I said, thank you for these shoes. She said, well, they're hey dudes. And, and I thought, well, that's cool because that's fun to say, hey dudes. You know, if somebody asks you, what shoes are you wearing? You can say, hey dude. And they're like, what? And it's, anyway. So hey dudes is kind of a fun uh, thing to say. And I, and I like those, but I started wearing those shoes. In fact, this is the second pair of hey dudes I've worn because the original Christmas present I've kind of worn out, right? I wear them all the time. I turns out I love these shoes. And those are words I've never said about shoes before. You know, I've never said that, but I was so excited about these hey dudes. A gift is sometimes more than you could expect. I, occasionally in the ministry of Jesus, he would do something and, and then say, yeah, but there's so much more. And on one occasion, there's a famous miracle. It's maybe Jesus' most famous miracle. It shows up in all four gospels. He feeds over 5,000 people with a couple fish and a few loaves of bread. We've heard this story before. We know how it goes. They, they, people are listening to Jesus teach and preach, and the disciples come to him, his closest group of 12 friends. They say, man, all these people are here. They haven't, they're not prepared to be here all day. They're going to get hangry in a minute. Let's send them home. And Jesus said, no, 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 you handle it. And and they said, we can't handle it. We don't have anything to feed them. And so Jesus said, go out and just bring back what you have. And so they go into the crowd and they, they find this little boy whose mom probably packed him this lunch of a couple fish and a few loaves of bread, this kind of happy meal kind of deal. And they bring it back and they say, this is what we got. And so Jesus said, start passing it out. And they pass out this food and they pass it out and they pass it out and they pass it out. And, and it just keeps going. And they feed over 5,000 people after Jesus gave thanks for what God had provided. And what's more, everybody ate until they were full, and then there were 12 baskets full of leftovers. 
I, it's so amazing. And, and I suppose if you were in that crowd, you could understand how it would sort of leave you longing for more. You, you would want to see what's next with this guy. I've got to be here tomorrow for the matinee. I, I, got, I have to know what's coming up. And so people sort of, some people maybe went home and scattered out, but so many of them stayed and just sort of camped out in the area waiting to see what was next. Jesus, after this miracle subsides, he sends his disciples back across the lake in the, in the boat, the only boat that was there, and he goes to hang out with his father in prayer. And after a while, the storm sets in, and, and the disciples aren't making much progress. And so Jesus walks across the Sea of Galilee to the boat. He gets into the boat, and then Scripture says instantly the boat was on the other side of the lake. And so Jesus performs this next crazy miracle by walking across the Sea of Galilee, and, and he saves his, rescues his disciples, and they show up on the other side, and that's where they are the next morning when people start to look for him, to look for Jesus and the disciples. They can't find them. They think the disciples left in the boat, but Jesus stayed, but now he's not here, so where is Jesus? And word eventually gets out that he's on the other side of the lake, and so people go in search of Jesus, and when they find Jesus... They ask, you know, how did you get here? When did you arrive? And they have several questions that they ask Jesus. And Jesus preaches maybe the most controversial sermon that he ever preaches in the Gospels. I, in fact, it, it, I, I'm not even sure if it's like a one-time setting because what I think happens is Jesus is teaching and having a conversation with this crowd of people as they leave the place where they find him and they walk back to his sort of home base in Capernaum on the other side of the Sea of Galilee again. And, and Jesus shares with them this really controversial message where he's essentially telling them there's so much more than that bread and fish you ate yesterday that I want to do so much more in your life than that. And Jesus said, these are the expectations that I have for you for all of eternity and as followers of Jesus, man, we should absolutely want to know the expectations that he has for us. And after feeding 5,000 and walking across the Sea of Galilee, Jesus teaches this message in John the 6th chapter, verses 22 to 59. That's the section of scripture we're going to take a look at this morning. He teaches this message, whether it's in a conversation or in a, in, in a teaching kind of setting like this, where he shares those expectations, four expectations that Jesus has for his followers. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open them up to John the sixth chapter. We're going to take a look at verses 22 to 59 this morning. I'm, typically, we, we read the scripture we're studying all at once in the beginning and then go back to it. We're going to break that up into chunks as we uh, work our way through these four expectations this morning. John the sixth chapter beginning in verse 22, expectation number one is that Jesus expects us to approach him. Jesus expects us to approach him. Let's take a look at verses 22 to 27 here in John chapter 6. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered, them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. So you see at the beginning of our passage this morning, in verses 22 to 24, there's an awful lot of seeking, of searching, of approaching Jesus going on. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea. I think I have a map of the Sea of Galilee, and if you see in the northeast sort of 
side of the Sea of Galilee at the top of the picture there, there's this town, Bethsaida. And that's where we think the feeding of the 5,000 probably happened in that area. And so that's where the story really sort of begins. Jesus feeds this crowd and, and everybody's excited and, and they kind of hang out there and they're waiting for the next day. But Jesus sends his disciples in a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. And so they head towards Tiberias. And you can kind of see that maybe the squiggly line on the map because there's a storm and they don't make much progress. But eventually Jesus catches up to them. He's the red dotted line and, and he catches up to them, gets in the boat, and then the boat shows up on the other side at Tiberias. So that's where Jesus and his disciples go. And, and everybody wakes up the next morning. Some folks maybe went back home if they lived in Capernaum or, or close to that area. They went back home, but many people probably stayed sort of festival style and camped out waiting to see Jesus the next day. And they wake up, they're looking around, they can't find him. They're, they know that there was only one boat and that that boat was filled with the disciples and that the disciples headed to the other side of the lake, but that Jesus didn't go with them. And so they're looking for Jesus. They can't find them. Some other boats show up, right? And uh, in verse 23, other boats from Tiberias came near to the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. And so some other boats came across that morning from Tiberias to Bethsaida. And, and they're, we're not sure why. Uh, some folks think that that storm blew them off course. All right. And so they show up there the next day. We're not talking about a huge uh, geographical area here with the Sea of Galilee. So I'm not sure if that's the deal, but maybe. I think uh, the, the idea I like best is that they came looking for Jesus first, but, but secondly, they came looking to be a taxi service for that crowd that they had heard that was gathered for Jesus. And they thought, we can take these folks back home or we can take them to wherever they want, you know, for a fee. And so maybe they were just looking to scrounge up a little business. But whatever event, these boats show up and they're like, Jesus isn't here. And so people get into the boats and they head first to Capernaum looking for Jesus. That was sort of his home base of ministry. Jesus wasn't there. And so then those boats go all the way back to the other side of the sea to Tiberias where Jesus and the disciples were. There's just an awful lot of searching going on for Jesus. And so this crowd ends up back around Jesus in Tiberias in verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now that's a that's an okay question to ask, isn't it? They, they knew the boat left with the disciples. Jesus wasn't in it. They didn't see this guy walking across the water. That's not the first thing that pops into your mind. He probably took a stroll across the sea, right? And so they're, how did you get here? Where, when did you get here? And they continue on in verse 26. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And I just kind of, I sense, I understand what Jesus is thinking. You guys aren't really looking for me. You guys don't really want to know who I am. Uh, this last week, it, the weather shifted here and, and you know, the temperature dropped from like 70 degrees one day to 10 degrees the next day. And so the next day when it's 10 degrees, maybe we think, well, it's February in Kansas. We ought to be used to that. But it didn't, it just feel, it felt so cold, didn't it? After kind of the warm weather. And I thought, oh man, this is terrible. And, and I get a, a text message towards the end of the day here in the office. And Sherry said, hey, this is what Zoe wants for supper. She wants something from this restaurant. And I said, that, that's good. I, I like shoes and I like supper. I'm in, right? I'm, I'm good with that. And so, yeah, and, and Sherry texted back and she said, well, do you want to meet us at this restaurant? It's 10 degrees outside. Or do you want to pick this up and bring it home? And so then I'm trying to discern what's the right answer here. And, and I said, well, I'll pick it up and bring it home. If that's what you'd prefer, that's cool. And so I, it, they send the orders. And I go to the restaurant. I pick up the food. And I get home. I walk through the front door. And Zoe, uh, she, she came out of her room. And, and, you know, she's 17. And so it's been a long time. But I remember when kids were, the kids were little and I came home. And they would be so excited, like genuinely excited to see me. They're like, Dad's home, something new, you know? And, and so they, they'd come out and, yay, Dad's home. And Zoe came out of the room like she was 
three. Yo, Dad, you're home. And I said, yes, I am. She said, I, I said, it's good to see you, Zoe. And she said, yeah. And I said, are you really excited to see me? And she said, I'm hungry. <laughs> right? I, I feel that too. I understand that too. I get it. And, but that's sort of where Jesus is at in, in verse 26. He's like, you, you're not really looking for me. You know, you're looking for a full belly again. You were excited about the bread. You were excited about the fish. Verse 27, he goes on to say, do not work for the food that perishes. It's sort of interesting, kind of ironic, I guess, that these folks, he's saying, hey, don't work for food that perishes. And he's talking to this crowd of people who have sort of ignored their responsibilities for at least a couple of days. You know, the 40-hour the work week is, is not known to the first century. You know, there wasn't a weekend. And so kind of give us this day our daily bread. You know, we, we're working for that daily bread. And they ignored that for at least a couple of days at this point, you know, searching for that, that free lunch. He says, don't work, though, for food that perishes. And, and he's not really talking about those jobs that they're ignoring. He's not really talking about don't simply... Uh, don't work for, for this, this bread, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. In other words, Jesus is saying, I need you to rearrange your lives for me. I want you to reprioritize your lives for me. This job you go to every day to, to earn money, to feed your that's important, but it's not the most important. Whatever it is that you're putting, in, you, I want you to rearrange this and put me first. He, he said, the Son of Man will give this bread to you. The Son of Man is Jesus' favorite title for himself. It's the title he uses most often in describing himself. And I think because it, it wraps up who he is. Son of Man could mean simply a human being. He's a son of this person, right? He's, he's descended from this line of people. He's a human or it could, but as Jewish readers and would hear Son of Man and they'd think of the prophets like Daniel who used the Son of Man to describe Messiah. And so wrapped up in that phrase of Son of Man isn't just a description of somebody who's fully human, but somebody who is fully God. And so Jesus' favorite title for himself puts those two ideas together. He wants to describe himself and, and tell us who he really is. And all through the book of John, all through John's Gospels, Jesus describes himself to us with these I am statements. The first one we're taking a look at this morning in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, I am uh, the, the door to the sheep and I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 11, I'm the resurrection and the life. In John chapter 14, I'm the way, the truth and the life. In John chapter 15, I am the vine. And he uses these phrases to describe something about who he is. And they each begin with, I am. Now that would have registered in the, the ears and the minds and the hearts, perhaps, of his listeners. His Jewish audience would have thought about the first time they heard that phrase, I am who I am. Exodus chapter 3, uh, Moses has fled Egypt, he's working as a shepherd, and God shows up to call Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. And he, he calls Moses to, to this mission through a burning bush that's on fire but isn't being consumed. And so Moses is like, he's drawn to this. This is interesting. This is something I've never seen before. You know, Moses thinks, I've seen bushes catch on fire, but they don't hang around long. And this one isn't burning up. It's not being consumed. And so Moses gets a little closer, and, and, and the voice of God from that burning bush speaks and says, Stop. Don't come any further. Take off your sandals because you're on holy ground. You're about to have a conversation. You are in the presence of the Creator God, of this big, big God. And that voice continues to share with Moses his mission to, to go and, and rescue God's people from slavery in Egypt. And Moses is 
has already fled Egypt one time. He's not exactly, uh, not necessarily filled with courage at this point in his life. And so he is kind of registering some concerns about this request from God. And he said, look, you know, if I get there, and I'm talking to Pharaoh, right, and I'm talking to these, these people, and they ask, you know, who sent you? What am I supposed to say? And the voice from the bush said, you tell them that I am who I am has sent you. Now, that might sound a little bit odd to us, and I suppose it is, but the, the point behind it, the emphasis behind it is that, hey, Moses, before you were, I am. When you are gone, I am. It's God saying, I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the alpha and the omega. We've heard these, this, this terminology in scripture. That I am the God of the universe. That I'll always be. And so when Jesus fills us in a little bit about who he is, he's speaking as if he is the God of the universe. I am, in John chapter 6, the bread of life. I will sustain you. And that creator God, that sustainer God, that redeemer God, that big, big God expects us to approach him. Jesus expects us to approach him. Now with some caution, perhaps, aware of who he is, but he expects a relationship with us. That's expect, expectation number one. Expectation number two is that Jesus expects us to believe. Let's take a look at verse 28. Jesus expects us to believe. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered him, this is the work of God that you believe in whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven. Uh, to, to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son believe in him should, not have, eternal, should have eternal life and I will raise him up on that last day. Verse 40 says, let's try that again, it's pretty important. For this is the will of God of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. And so uh, the, the crowd asks their second question. All right, so you say, Jesus, you don't want us to work for this food that perishes. Then what, how should we work? What should we do? And Jesus responds in verse 29. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Your work, in other words, is to believe in me. Now, sometimes in the church, we struggle with this idea uh, between works and belief. We, we kind of elevate belief, and we kind of hold it up as this kind of spiritual high ground, and we think, well, th these works don't really matter all that much. But here, Jesus brings those two ideas together, doesn't he? He doesn't say, hey, there's no work involved here. There's nothing that you need to do. He said that your work is believing in me. It reminds me of when I was a kid, I collected baseball cards. In fact, just this last Thanksgiving, I brought some home from my parents' house, and I'm looking through these cards. I'm having a great time looking at these different players and these cards, and then I put them away in a closet somewhere. I haven't looked at them since, but that's how baseball cards go. I remember as a kid, is, you know, some people would say, don't open that pack of baseball cards. Because in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, that unopened pack of baseball cards will be worth way more. And I thought, that is dumb. You know, because first of all, you can't, you, you don't know what you have. I mean, is it a George Brett or a John Wathen in the baseball card pack? You don't know. And, and besides, I love to look through the cards and kind of play with them and, and, and put them in teams. I didn't have many friends. And so that's what I did with the baseball cards. 
You know, I thought, this is great. I want to look at these. You've got to get it out of the package to determine what's going on. And real faith isn't lived in a package, kind of inside. And sometimes we talk about belief like that unopened pack of baseball cards. It's really valuable. It's more important than what you can see going on around here. And Jesus said, your work is to believe in me. Your work is to follow after me. They said to them in verse 30, uh, uh, I, I love this. So they asked him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? They, they just ate lunch, right? Jesus has just fed over 5,000 people. He just walked across the Sea of Galilee. You know, what work do you do? I'm being a little hard on this crowd because they kind of fill in what they're thinking here in, in verse 32, uh, verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So what sign do you do to tell us where you're really from? Are you really from heaven? I mean, we saw this, this bread that came from that little boy in his knapsack. What's this bread from heaven? What sign do you do from heaven to reveal who you really are? Jesus then said to them in verse 32, Truly, truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you true bread from heaven. That's Jesus. Uh, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. So a couple of important things here. First, Jesus is interpreting the Old Testament with this typological view, all right? So he says, uh, the, the manna that your ancestors enjoyed, that's the type. That's what the Old Testament teaches. And then Jesus, so, uh, he's the anti-type. That's weird language because he's not the opposite of manna, really. He's the fulfillment of manna. He's the real manna. He's the real bread from heaven that matters. Eventually, he's going to get to a point that he says, look, what happened to all these people who ate the manna? Well, they died. It didn't sustain them. You know, it wasn't enough for eternity. Jesus' point here is that I'm enough for eternity. When you believe that I'm enough, then you'll live forever, he's, he's eventually going to say. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. I'm this eternal provision. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 34, sir, give us this bread always. Uh, other places in John, we, we get this uh, encounter with Jesus at the well, the woman at the well, and, and you might maybe remember that conversation. Jesus said, I've got some water, and you, if you drink it, you'll never get thirsty. And the woman said, what? She said, I want this water so that I'll never thirst. What did she mean? She meant, I want this water so I'll never get thirsty, so I don't have to come draw the water anymore. So I don't have to do this work and come to the well and maybe be you know, ridiculed by the townspeople and all the things she was going through. I want to escape that. I want to drink it so I'll never be thirsty again. Hear the same conversation, right? I want to eat this bread so I'll never be hungry again. What do they mean? I don't want to go back to work. I don't want to worry about uh, what happens tomorrow. I don't want to worry about any of that stuff. Give, provide for me this, this sustenance in the, in, in the now. Jesus said, I'm bigger than that. I'm the bread of life. I'm this eternal provision. Verse 36, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Verse 37 to 40, though, are, are great comfort to us. It says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will be raised up on that last day day. Jesus expects us to believe, and in verses 37 to 40 kind of, kind of demonstrate for us how we come to that belief. There, there's some big theological ideas here, all right, and, and uh, sort of the, the first big idea that, that some people think verses 37 to 40 describe is that, that God determines who will be saved and, and delivers those individuals to a son, and that salvation is ultimately a decision of a sovereign God, a big God who's in control, and, and not dependent on human free will. 
Okay, a second option kind of says that, that God draws people to himself and to his son by his love, which has been sh- shared in the hearts of people. And finally, I, I think the New Testament teaches that God gives uh, people to his son through a combination of his divine drawing and our human turning, that people come to Jesus by their own free choice. All right, I think when you listen to the language and you kind of Pay attention. Go home and, and look at verses 37 to 40 uh, a little bit more because we don't have time to unpack all of this. But uh, it's language that, that is kind of a two-way street, right? Now, that two-way street isn't equal. In other words, there's not equal work being done on both sides of the salvation kind of equation. You know, God, Jesus does all of the real heavy lifting. But, but there is an element of us accepting, of turning, of saying yes to Jesus, of believing in who he is. And and so uh, while God does so much more, we, we still have this opportunity while we're drawing breath to say yes to him. And while we're drawing breath, we have the opportunity to say no to him and go our own way. Jesus expects us to believe For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I'll raise Him up on that last day. When this crowd talks about, you know, heavenly, what's coming from heaven, what's heavenly bread, Jesus describes Himself as coming from heaven six six times in this chapter. He describes Himself in this way. Four times in this chapter, He describes Himself as being raised up on that last day, raising us up on that last day as well, by the way. That, that's the salvation is, a, is eternity in his presence, is resurrection in the same way that Jesus was resurrected. Jesus expects us to believe. Expectation number three is that Jesus expects us to live forever. Let's take a look at verses 41 to 51. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? So this is, this is again, I think a legitimate kind of take from this crowd. They're like, we know uh, Jesus' family. We know his mom. We know his dad. We know his brothers. You know, who is this guy to say that he's come from heaven? And so they grumbled. They, they, they talked about him this way. That, that language grumbled. It, it again points back to the Exodus story. You remember when the, the people of God were wandering in the wilderness and, and it describes them as grumbling. You know, I know you just rescued us from hundreds of years of slavery, but we don't like the trip. And so they grumbled about what was going on. And that same language, they grumbled about this. Uh, you know, and it's found not just in the Exodus chapter 16 or in Numbers chapter 14, but in God's people today in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and James chapter 5, we have a tendency to kind of resort back to this same place, right? Okay, Jesus, you saved us. You rescued us. You know, where, where's the bread? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves, verse 43. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on that last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he lives forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus expects us to live forever. When we say yes to him, we enter into a relationship that extends into all of eternity. There are so many questions in our world today. Right There are things going on in your life that I don't know about that are, are struggles and challenges that you are facing today. Maybe it's a diagnosis from a doctor. Maybe it's a relationship that hasn't worked out the way you intended it to work out. Maybe it's something that I have no idea about that I can't relate to. You are facing those challenges, yet God is bigger than those challenges. 
There are, there are things facing our world, whether it's a, a worldwide pandemic, a virus that we can't get under control, that we can't make sense of, that we can't fix, or it's a war breaking out in Europe that we are worried will extend beyond those borders. God is bigger than those things. However he makes a way for us to know him and for us to say yes to him, he holds us fast. That eternal life begins today in relationship with him. Now we ought to, we ought to rest in those words that whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. That we are in the hands and the arms of a big, big God who loves us in a big, big way. And he expects us to be in those arms forever and ever and ever. Expectation uh, number four is that Jesus expects us to consume him. Let's take a look at verses uh, 52 to 59 here. This is kind of, this is where the, the message gets really kind of weird. And at the end of the message, people kind of go their own way, many of them. It was hard for them to hear this, and, and I think you'll see why. Verse 52 says, The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of, the, of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. That's my favorite part. He said these things in church. So, you know, even these things he said in church. He said, I want you to consume me. He talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. You know, they, they ask, how can he ask this? You know, what, what's he saying? And you sort of expect Jesus to kind of back up a little bit and say, look, it's a metaphor, relax. But he doesn't, he doubles down on it. You, you've got to be all in, Jesus is saying. Now, we read these words, eat his flesh and drink his blood, and I, I think we can't help as, as, a, as a church body that participates in communion every week, now we talk about you know, this, this bread that is his body and this juice that is his blood an awful lot, right, that represents those things. And so I, 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 I can't help but read these words and look at communion. But I don't think Jesus is talking about communion here. I think Jesus is looking ahead to what communion looks back at. Jesus is looking ahead to his death and resurrection, that there's a price to pay that I will pay. It's, it's a real price. Jesus will really die on the cross. He'll really be beaten. He'll really be buried. He will really raise from the dead. And so these, these verses look forward to Jesus' death and resurrection. And our communion celebration looks backwards to his death and resurrection. And so while I don't think Jesus was specifically talking about communion, it's appropriate that we kind of wrap that up in what he is talking about. It's just different perspectives in the timeline. We're looking back and he's looking forward. Jesus said, I want you to consume me. And that means, that means being all in with Jesus. I, I think there's a couple ways that we do this, right? We, we really trust him. You know, I thought about as, a, as an illustration, you know, inviting a few people to come up in front of the stage and then to link arms, and then I would fall into those arms, trusting them. The problem is I don't trust you that much, <laughs> right? I've spent years developing this table. There's lots of things that go into that decision, right? But Jesus is saying, I want you to take that plunge. I want you to jump in to consume me. And, and for, uh, for all of us, that's something different, probably, 
For some of us, that might be saying yes to Jesus for the first time, for, for acknowledging that he's done the hard work, and now I'm going to do my little part of this and turn to him and say yes to him and receive him in baptism to kind of literally take that plunge into water. For some of us, that means getting involved in a ministry team that we talked about last week and, and, and getting our faith, getting our belief out of the package and living it out loud. For some of us, maybe that's, that's getting involved in a, in a small group and, and, and learning from other believers and studying God's word together. And those small groups for 1KC start in just a, another week. There's groups forming right now where you can be a part of, of, of focusing on Jesus' miracles in the Gospel of John, building relationships with other believers, studying God's word together. There's a registration form in your bulletin that you can sign up for those. Fill them out, drop them in the wooden boxes. For some of us, that, that might mean, hey, we just need to spend time daily with him. John chapter 1 begins by saying, the word became flesh. That logos, Jesus, enters the world. He puts, he puts skin on. He becomes flesh. And now we're to devour, to consume him, to devour the word of God. This 40 days of listening and reading uh, leading up to Easter, what a great opportunity for us to prepare our hearts and minds for the celebration of Easter, just to devour God's word as he calls. This last Friday night, we kicked off 1KC with this worship and prayer night at Westside Leavenworth, and, and a few of you were there. I, as Sherry and I had the chance to go, and, and I've got to tell you, look, preachers say things from the stage that they know they ought to say. Like, if you're anxious today, if you're worried about whatever's going on in the world, if there's something in your life that is hurting your heart, you know, preachers will say the place you need to be is in the presence of God. You need to seek him in worship. You need to be in his word. You need to pray. You know, Friday night, I experienced that. Just being able to cast your, your cares on him because he loves you. you know, that's for real. That really changes us. And so I, I hope you, you, you hear that I'm not perfect at this. You know, these 40 days of, of reading and listening, you know, I'm going to miss a day. I'm going to miss three days. I'm going to miss whatever. I'm not perfect at this. I don't want you to get the idea that you have to check all these boxes and be perfect. But I promise you that if you will seek him in ministry and service, if you'll seek him in, 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 in small groups and Bible study, if you'll seek him daily in prayer, that it will make a difference in your life. You know, Jesus expects us to consume him. I don't remember exactly what Christmas it was. Clayton, our, our oldest, was, uh, you know, he was the only one then. And it was uh, maybe his second Christmas. He was born on December 20th. He might have just been one year old. You're going to have to ask Sherry for the details. <laughs> and uh, I remember, though, he, just, he was just learning to talk. He could only say a few words, and one of those words was ball. You know, he loved to play with basketballs and baseballs or whatever, you know, bouncy balls. He was a little kid. And uh, for Christmas, we bought him this collection of balls. And so we wrapped it up all neat. I'm not sure why parents do this when kids, you know, they can't open the present really themselves and they're just figuring that out, but we do that. And so we wrapped it all up and he's kind of pulling the paper back and you're kind of, you know, don't look away, Clayton. Whoop, there it is. We got to move on, you know? And, and he, so he's looking at this present and then he sees that it's this little soccer ball and this little basketball and this little football. And so he says, ball, ball, ball. He was so excited for this gift. He was so excited for what he thought would, would make a difference, right? Every week here at Wallula Christian Church, we, we celebrate the greatest gift in all of eternity. We, we, we participate in communion together. We eat a little piece of bread that represents Jesus' body. We drink a cup of juice that represents his blood. We remember that he chose to go to the cross to die in our place, to pay a price that I owe and I cannot afford to pay on my own. That he really died on the cross, that he was really buried in the tomb, that he really rose from the dead. And this is the greatest gift ever. 
that when we come to him, he's not going to let us go. He's not going to chase us off that we have the opportunity to be in his presence for all of eternity. And so this morning as we, you, you can go ahead and move. I know some of you are doing that. And, and so the boxes are in the middle of the aisle and on the side. If you're on the sides, you can grab uh, those elements from those boxes. Go ahead and separate those cups, the bread and the juice. And as we eat that bread and we drink that juice, you know, really we ought to be saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We ought to be so excited for the gift that he's provided us. Go ahead and eat that bread and drink that juice. Father God, we are so grateful that you are a big, big God, that uh, since before creation, you've existed, that everything we see you've put into place, that you've made a way for each of us, even a guy like me, to know you through your son, Jesus. Father God, we, we come to you right now and, and we just say, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name. Amen.